Good evening. We would like to welcome everyone to the Division of Academics, Family and Community Cluster Training. Our training is about to begin. Good evening, parents and everyone that has joined us this evening. We are happy to have you for our Division of Academics, Family and Community Cluster Training. We always like to begin with our meeting norms, and as you can see, they are displayed on the screen. We always expect for everyone that is a part of our time together to be polite and respectful to others. Always ask questions in the chat and we will monitor the chat so that we can get your questions answered. Be sure to stay focused on the topics at hand and always be patient and assume that everyone is doing their best. Our agenda is as follows. We've already began with our welcome. My name is Yolanda Weeks. I serve as the Executive Director of Curriculum and Instruction. So our agenda is as follows. We are going to go over our APS map and our BASC-3 best data. Then we'll go through our telehealth services, which speaks about physical and ment mental health as well as APS personalized learning focus, our APS map vision for teaching and learning, and then we'll have time for question and answers. Our division of academics is led by our chief academic officer, Yolanda Brown. Her program director is Mr. Thomas Munn, who has joined on the call. She has administ an administrative manager, Ms. Beatrice Jones, as well as a front desk administrative assistant, the wonderful Ms. Tracy Carroll. We are led by three assistant superintendents. Our superintendent of teaching, assistant superintendent of teaching and learning is Selena Florence, Dr. Selena Florence, that is. Our assistant superintendent of student service is Chelsea Montgomery, who just joined us on the team. And we are so excited to have um, Chelsea with us and also our assistant superintendent of instructional technology, Dr. Aaliyah Henderson-Rosser. And as you can see, our department is divided up of, our division is divided up amongst three different departments as stated. Dr. Florence, who leads the department that I'm a part of, teaching and learning. It's all things curriculum and instruction. We also do the work of ESOL, DLI, as well as world languages. Early learning, which is our pre-K department and all of our earlier learners, CTAE and signature programs, as well as social, social and emotional learning, which is also known as SEL, and our JROTC department. Chelsea Montgomery leads student services. That's health services, student support and intervention, as well as special, special education and our summer and after school programs. Dr. Henderson Roster leads our instructional technology, which is media services. And that's all of our media specialists that are now in every school, our instructional development and design which is also known as ID, IDD, and they, they lead our professional learning, as well as instructional technology. And last but not least, virtual programs, also known as AVA, which is a K through 12 virtual school. Our strategic plan, this serves as the anchor for our work and provides specific goals for our district around literacy, math, 
college and career readiness and post-graduation preparedness. And so I have began our talk. And one thing that we do, all of what we do is governed by our APS5. And I'm sure you've heard it before. The five are data, curriculum and instruction, whole child and intervention, as well as personalized learning. And last but not least, signature programs. That's our IB as well as our STEM and or STEM schools. At this point, I am going to bring on Dr. Monique O'Brien so that she can talk about NWEA math. Thank you and good afternoon, parents and community members. In school year 2021-2022, APS began administering the NWEA MAP assessment to help us monitor our progress towards improving student literacy and numeracy proficiency. The MAP reading and MAP assessments allow us to estimate how well elementary and middle school students will perform on the Georgia milestones English language arts and math assessments. MAP accurate, accurately classifies students into the correct proficiency categories 82 to 84% of the time for ELA and 84 to 87% of the time for math. From looking at our data, approximately 31% of students in grades three to eight performed at a proficiency level of proficient or distinguished in the spring 2022 Georgia Milestones ELA assessment. This can be seen by looking at the two green colored rectangles. This is comparable to 34% of students on the spring map reading assessment who scored at the proficiency or distinguished levels. Similarly, 26% of students in grades three to eight performed at a proficiency level of proficient or distinguished on the spring 2022 Georgia Milestones Math Assessment compared to 25% of students on the spring MAP Math Assessment. During the month of August, we administered the MAP assessment to students in grades pre-K through 12th grade. We are currently in our second year of administering the MAP assessment, which allows us to compare student growth from fall 2021 to fall 2022 for students enrolled in APS during both test windows. Approximately 59% of students in the district are showing average to high growth in reading from fall 2021 to fall 2022 when compared to students across the nation. Our cluster level data is showing similar patterns in students' growth. This means we are headed in the right direction with growing our students academically in reading. An additional perk of the MAP assessment is that it allows the district to use the fall MAP reading results to estimate spring ELA milestone performance for students in grades second to eighth. While the best estimate of spring ELA milestone performance is the spring MAP assessment, the fall MAP assessment estimates, estimate allows us to gauge whether we are headed in the right direction. Fall 2022 MAP results indicate that the district and clusters are reducing the percentage of students performing in the beginning level compared to fall of last school year. Additionally, the percentage of students performing at the proficient or distinguished levels has increased from fall of last year to fall of this year. Similar to reading, our students are seeing growth in mathematics. Approximately 65% of students in the district are showing average to high growth in mathematics from fall 2021 to fall 2022 when compared to students across the nation. Our cluster level data is showing similar patterns in students' growth 
in mathematics. This speaks to our strategy to support our students in mathematics. We can use the fall map mathematics estimates of the Georgia milestone achievement levels to gauge whether we are headed in the right direction. Fall 2022 map results indicate that the district and cluster level, we are reducing the percentage of students performing at the beginning level in mathematics compared to fall of last school year. Additionally, the percentage of students performing at the proficient and distinguished levels in mathematics have increased from last fall to this fall. Before I hand it over to Dr. Hervey to discuss the BAS-3 assessment, I just wanted to take a moment to answer one of the questions that was in the chat. The question is, is map data by school available for Spanish for DLI students who took the Spanish portions? The answer to that question is yes. Um, for the map data, we are able to get growth data for our DLI students that participated in the Spanish version, language version of the test. Um, in both reading as well as mathematics. Okay. Thank you, Dr. O'Brien. Yes, I will be bringing you all updates regarding the BAS 3 BIS. Next slide. As part of the whole child framework, the district secured its first ever universal social emotional behavior screener last school year, which is the BAS 3 BIS. The BIS screens for a variety of behavior and emotional disorders that can lead to adjustment problems. This tool is a quick and efficient way to obtain screener data for students ages 3 to 18 for behavior and emotional risk. Next slide. So you may be asking, why screen for social, emotional, behavioral health? In addition to learning more about the risks all students may be subject to, the beauty of this screener is that it will help to put students on the radar of school staff who otherwise may not be there. What we have learned is that schools may not be aware of the inner and emotional struggles of students who don't advocate for themselves or students who seem to have good grades and typical behavior. The data from this screener will create an evidence-based pathway for students to receive additional supports, provide information that will help schools to focus their effort, time, and resources on students who have the highest needs, and will aid schools in making big picture programming decisions in support of students. Next slide. The screener is administered twice per school year, once in the fall and once in the spring. The fall administration window just closed on October the 7th, and the spring administration window will open February the 6th and then close on March the 3rd. Parents, you will receive a score report following each administration window, and for the fall administration window, you should have received your score report by October the 28th. If you did not, please do reach out to your student school counselor. The World Languages Department worked collaboratively with the Student Support Department to ensure that the needs of English learners and their families were addressed throughout the screening process. And the World Languages Department will work with schools to ensure that all families understand their child screener report. I'd like to take a moment to review what you will see as you are reviewing your child screener report. First, take note of the BAS 3 BEST screener indexes and their explanations. These acronyms you will see again in the next few slides as I preview sample score reports. The screener will produce student data that is measured in risk. Teacher and parent forms will reveal whether a student is at risk for developing externalizing behaviors, such as hyperactivity or aggression, internalizing behaviors such as anxiety or depression, 
or adaptive skills deficits or problems with communication or social skills. Student forms will reveal whether a student is at risk for developing internalizing behaviors, again, such as anxiety or depression, self-regulation deficits, such as hyperactivity or attention problems, or personal adjustment deficits, such as relationship problems, self-esteem challenges, or self-reliance issues. Students are given an overall score, which is the BERIT score, that indicates how far their score is from the average of the norm group. The color coding helps to give you a glance at how risk is measured as normal risk, elevated risk, or extremely elevated risk. Next slide. When you receive your cover letter and score report from your child's school, it may be printed in color, such as the copy on the left, or it may be printed in black and white, such as the copy on the right. The two reports are the same and both provide you with the same information. I wanna point out that even if you receive the black and white copy of the report, if you take note of the words next to the gray dot, then you will see whether the indexes were determined to be normal, elevated, or extremely elevated for risk. I want you to have an opportunity to view an example of what a screener report could tell you for each student. In the next few slides, I'll provide more explanation of the individual components of a score report. This is an example of a sample score report for a fourth grade elementary school student. We'll call her Sheila E. And she's at ABC Elementary School. On the score report, you see the assessment results and validity indicators. If you look in the column that says assessment results, you see the BERI or the Behavioral and Emotional Risk Index, which indicates how far away from the norm average your student scored. Remember the color coding that I referenced earlier. The green dot and wording next to the BERI tells us that this student has scored as normal risk, which does not indicate a need for support or follow-up at this time. The validity indicators provide an explanation of the extent to which this particular score report may be considered valid and that you can trust the outcome of the report. Validity index indicators will show as green for acceptable, yellow for caution, or red for extreme caution. The F index will let you know how harsh or overly negative the rater was in their responses. The consistency index will let you know if there were different conflicting responses provided to questions that are similar. The response pattern index lets you know if a pattern was detected that may indicate that the rater selected answers randomly or in a pattern. Here you see that the F index, consistency index, and response pattern index is acceptable, which means that you can trust the outcome of this report. Next slide. Part of the score report that you receive will contain the actual student responses to the questions asked and the frequency to which these items occur, that being never, sometimes, often, or always. This student acknowledges that she sometimes has trouble sitting still, sometimes feels like her life is getting worse and worse, and sometimes feels that no one understands her. This student also acknowledges that school feels good to her always. Others have respect for her always, and her parents like to be with her always. Reviewing the individual questions can provide you as a parent with more information to better understand how your student may currently interpret their day-to-day -day environment. However, remember that the BERI of this score report was normal risk, which means that the responses this student shared are comparable to the average norm of other students that have taken this screener. Next slide. This is an example of a score report for a 10th grade high school student, we'll call this student Tyler P at XYZ High School. The red dot and the wording next to the BERI 
tells us that this student has scored as extremely elevated in risk, which may indicate a need for support. Note that I said that although the BERI is listed as extremely elevated, there may need to be uh, an assessment for support. That is because the score report is a starting point and there are other actions that are necessary to be taken by student support staff to confirm risk and identify need before recommending support. Also noted is that internal risk, which measures risk for behaviors associated with depression or anxiety, is elevated for risk and the self-regulation index, which measures risk for self-control is extremely elevated for risk. Since this student scored elevated for both internal and self-regulation risks, support may be needed in both areas. According to the validity indicators, you can see that the F index, consistency index, and response pattern index are all acceptable which means that you can trust the outcome of this report. Next slide. The second part of this student score report provides you as parent and school staff with more information on where additional support may be indicated. This student endorses having trouble sitting still always. His parents trust him never. His school feels good to him never. He feels like his life is getting worse and worse always. He forgets to do things always. He gets into trouble for not paying attention always. And he is never good at making decisions. Again, this information is a starting point that helps to point others in the right direction of where to begin in supporting this student. Next slide. Now that I've briefly explained how to interpret a score report, I wanna provide you with a few pointers to remember while viewing your child's BAS 3 BEST report. The purpose of the screener is to identify students who might benefit from additional resources or follow up with a trained school professional. Again, as I've said a couple of times this afternoon, the BAS 3 BEST is a starting point. School student support staff may take additional steps to confirm risk and identify the needs of any student who has a score report that is extremely elevated for risk and elevated for risk. Results of the screener are based on a student's responses on a given day, and they are not meant in any way to be considered a diagnosis. Most students will have their needs met by services that are already provided by the school but additional support is available when and if deemed necessary. Parents and guardians, you are partners in this process with schools, and you will be consulted if risk is com uh, confirmed and additional supports are recommended. The data provided by the BAS 3 BEST empowers school staff to build stronger programming to meet the needs of students. At Tier 1, schools may focus on building community, increasing programming to bolster behavioral support, and be proactive in taking steps to create a welcoming culture of inclusion. Other supports that are available at schools range from referrals with school-based staff, small groups, skill building, or a referral to receive support from a licensed professional. Next slide. Let me take a moment to say thank you to all of the parents, guardians, and family members and the support that you provide to students. Your role in this effort of providing for the needs of the whole child is key. Maintaining an open line of communication with school staff, working as a team with school staff to determine support interventions, engaging in conversations with your student about their day to day, and continuing to follow up with your child's school to provide updates and insight on how strategies and interventions are working, all of those are key. Thank you for your time this afternoon. That concludes my presentation. And now I will pause for questions. All right, I think I see some questions here. Let's see. Let me test the school doing 
outreach for high risk students is very long, needs to be a tighter time frame. Thank you for that information. What we provide schools is really a guide in terms of a response protocol. We want to ensure that no students are slipping through the cracks. Um, and so also being able to have a rolling uh, screener. So not screening all students at once, uh, but being able to perhaps take it by grade is some of the things that we've recommended to make this more um, of a way to chunk it so that uh, schools are able to be able to meet the needs of students that are identified. Um, Hope Bass 3 Best data to parents will also include new info on how to access the new virtual medical resources available to all. All right, so I think that question may be speaking about telehealth. Um, that is now in the district, and we are um, getting ready to give you a little bit more information about telehealth, but you will start to see more and more, and that will be on our webpage as well as BLAST that will be going out to parents about how to access that for your child. Okay. All right, and then um, Ms. Angel asks, is the BAS 3 for elementary through high school? And so students can begin to take the BAS 3 BEST when they are in the third grade or eight years old through the 12th grade or 18 years old. And so that is a student actually providing their own screener information. Um, teachers can, however, as well as parents, provide screener information for students beginning in kindergarten through 12th grade. And parents, you can provide screener information beginning in pre-K through the 12th grade. Okay. Uh, would be very helpful if BAS 3 data over the third through 12th journey of the child was available through Infinite Campus, so you can see changes over time. Thank you for that. I will certainly take note of that, and this is still something that's very new in the district, and we're always thinking of ways that we might be able to uh, close the gaps in terms of communication between home and school. So I appreciate that. All right. I do not see any additional questions. And so we will move on to our next section, um, which will be telehealth services, both for physical and mental health. Again, I'm Shannon Hervey. I'm the Director of Student Support. Um, and also uh, within this presentation, Dr. Hildreth will be co-presenting. Next slide. APS is excited to expand telehealth services to students that will increase access to acute physical care or short-term mental health care. School-based telehealth programs are a comprehensive approach to increasing children's access to health care and close the gaps in care resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic, such as mental health and other chronic conditions. Next slide. As you may be aware, APS partners with seven mental health wraparound providers who are assigned to schools throughout the district. During school year 22, we learned that our providers were faced with numerous challenges, including lack of funding, insurance challenges, guardian noncompliance, and provider shortages, which impeded their ability to provide support to our students. Also, during school year 22, what we know is that 37% of students, or almost 20,000 of our students, were chronically absent from school. Additionally, results of the BAS 3 BEST indicated that 25% of APS students were elevated or extremely elevated for risk of developing an emotional or behavior disorder. These data points are both relevant because according to research, health-related issues are a top reason why children miss days of school. Now I'll pass it along to Dr. Hildreth. She's going to bring data relative to physical health. Good, after, good evening. So as we look at the physical health information and data that we collected currently for our telehealth services, um, prior to us expanding to 
our other locations, we had two telehealth locations located at Fickett and Finch Elementary School. And those telehealth services were provided by our existing partnership with Children's Hair Care of Atlanta. So when we looked at our chronic conditions and our students with chronic conditions, we were able to find um, information um, from those that reported. And that information was the 1,293 APS students it identified with at least one chronic condition. And for the school year 2022, we also observed that 25,300 APS students were sent home by an RN or an LPN at their school. So this information was very key in us looking at the need for expansion as well as, of course, hearing from our student voice. So for school year 2023, with our APS whole child interventions, um, and, and initiatives, we include the following. So we, of course, want to expand our existing telehealth services beyond the two schools, um, and we have done that. And of course, to provide telehealth services to students on demand, not just for the physical component, but for the mental health services as well. And then we also wanna make telehealth available for students, not just at school, but at home. So they can have those resources beyond the school setting and access it when they're at home if, if they're not feeling well and need access to mental or physical health services. So when we look at the who, what, when, where, and why, we look at the services. Of course, Hazel Health is a provider for K through 12. They provide um, quality mental and physical health services to meet the mental and physical health needs of our students. And the what, high quality doctor visits, therapy sessions for our students. The physical health services are provided by Hazel doctors, nurse practitioners, and physician's assistants. The mental health components are provided by locally licensed, culturally competent therapists that specialize in addressing the needs of our students and our children and adolescents. So when is this available? Well, we, we already implemented this service. So during the hours of 7A to 7P Eastern Standard Time, students can access telehealth support at their home or in their school. And where are we rolling this out? We have rolled out phase one. Um, and we're rolling it out phase one. Uh, it was rolled out effective October the 31st, 2022. And those clusters were Therrell, Therrell, Douglas, North Atlanta, South Atlanta, and Jackson. And our phase two clusters will roll out November the 28th, 2022. And the phase two clusters are Midtown, Carver, Mays, Washington, and also our non-traditional sites. So why are we doing this? We're doing this to increase student access to services and the supports that they need to be well. And we also want to remove those barriers that may present um, for quality physical health and mental health support for all of our students. So what do we need to do next? Well, consenting, we cannot provide we cannot deliver, we can provide, but we cannot deliver services to any of our students without consenting to telehealth services. So we have a consent form that's available, as you see on the website, uh, on the slide, we have a website. And if you visit the website is https colon forward slash forward slash my dot hazel dot co forward slash Atlanta Public Schools. And that's what you will need to do to sign, click sign up now, and then fill out the consent form. And then once you send out the consent form, you will finish creating an account by entering your phone number and a six digit code will be sent to you via text. And you should use that to fill the information for your student, complete that information. And on the screen, you'll see what that, you'll see a screenshot of what the information that they are requesting when you complete that link. So Hazel Health at Home, we also have that website um, available. The link is https colon forward slash forward slash my dot hazel dot co forward slash patient. We launched this October the 24th. It is available to our students um, Monday through Friday from 7A to 7P. And also here's a screenshot of what that link looks like when you complete that information and you access this link. So that will complete our telehealth, physical, as well as mental health presentation. If you have any questions, we can look through the chat and we'll address those at this time. Okay. 
Okay. I think just for a point of clarity, our mental health services are available from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And our physical health services are available from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And that is, of course, with Hazel at home. I don't see any questions in the chat, so we will proceed. Good evening. Personalized learning is a major initiative in Atlanta Public Schools. This work is led by the Office of Instructional Technology under the leadership of Dr. Aliyah Henderson Rosser, our Assistant Superintendent. I am Jermaine Sumler Faison. I am the Director of Instructional Development and Design. Um, this evening, my colleagues and I will provide an overview of how personalized learning looks in our school district. Next slide. I'm sure that you all are familiar with our North Star in Atlanta Public Schools, which is the APS-5. One of the APS-5 is personalized learning. As a district, we are excited about this priority and we feel confident that it is a game changer for our students and their success in the classroom. Personalized learning is an instructional approach that empowers our students to build ownership of their learning. It's student-centered and it calls on us as educators to be responsive to the needs of our students to ensure that they receive the instruction they need when they need it. Our approach to personalized learning is one size fits one, not one size fits all. Here in APS, we are committed to providing our scholars with personalized learning experiences. And so in Atlanta Public Schools, we've adopted a framework for personalized learning that is aligned with our district priorities. Our core four is reflection and goal setting, targeted instruction, collaboration and creativity, and flexible path and pace. Our focus on the core four allows us to foster nurturing learning environments that promote student reflection. When we think about our core four, and, ref, uh, and the core four, uh, we see reflection and goal setting, which really um, allows our students to focus on self-awareness that can make goal setting truly meaningful. Targeted instruction um, is when we focus on allowing our students to articulate what they're learning and why they are learning it. Um, flexible path and pace allows us to focus on design and learning experiences that ensure students get what they need when they need it. And then collaboration and creativity discusses, allows students and creates a space for our students to discuss ideas, to make meaning, to problem solve um, around important issues that's relative to their schools and their community. Next slide. Next slide. In our school district, we are 100% committed to ensuring that personalized learning is evident in all of our schools over the next three years. Next slide. On the next slide, you'll see that our Wave 1 schools joined us during the 21-22 school year. So we're excited about our Wave 1 schools. Next slide. Because of the positive impact this work had on our Wave 1 schools, we now have 24 schools in Wave 2. So kudos to all of our personalized learning schools. All remaining APS schools will join Wave 3 during the next school year. Next, you'll meet Dr. Mr. Tommy Clay, and he will provide you with more examples of personalized learning in the context of instructional technology. Mr. Clay. Hello, my name is Tommy Clay. I'm the Digital Learning Specialist in Instructional Technology. Uh, next slide. So collaboration and creativity is a key part of personalized learning. It allows students to engage with one another, share ideas, create new solutions and projects. And one key aspect of that is having flexible tools that allow them to do that. Uh, next slide. So what does collaboration and why does collaboration and creativity matter? Well, several reasons. It helps students become independent thinkers. 
It encourages students to work with one another and share their ideas, to become creators and producers of their knowledge through creating um, creative solutions for projects. And they provide, students provide one another with feedback and then they can share with an authentic global audience. Um, so how do they access these resources? Students access these resources through our one-stop shop, My Backpack. All of the apps are located in My Backpack that allow students to engage in personalized learning. So we have tons of collaboration and creativity tools from Google Drawings to Zoom to Teams to Minecraft, EDU, and Wakelet. As as well as tools that allow for reflection and goal setting as examples include Adobe Express and Canva. Again, all of these tools are available in my backpack and your students have access to it, not only on their APS issue devices, but they can access these tools on their personal devices at home. And again, some of those tools for instructional tools and resources include Discovery Ed, Kahoot. And then we also have paper tutoring which is phenomenal, which is a tutoring, free tutoring website that allows your child to have access to a tutor 24 hours a day. We have tools for flexible path and pace that include Nearpod, Pear Deck, and Quizzes. And again, that URL at the bottom is how students access my backpack, and it is their one-stop shop. And that's, oh, you can go to the next slide. Now. <laughs> <laughs> so paper, is our new tremendous tutor platform. All APS students have access to paper. It's free of charge. It's available 24 seven. It's available on weekends, after school, during breaks. And it's accessible through my backpack. And then they can have an opportunity to live chat with certified tutors. And it's available for all content areas. Students commit submit papers for review and get access to tutors in just about any subject available, including Spanish, US history, literature, US um, uh, math. And it's available to elementary, middle and high school students. Um, also, there's a college essay support as well for those students, those seniors and juniors looking for college essay support. We can move to the next slide. Securely, ooh, Securely is a fantastic tool that's available to parents and Securely is our monitoring app that's available on all APS devices, but there's a parent app that's available that you as a parent can access to monitor what your students are doing real time. You can monitor their online activity. You can flag activities listed for self-harm. Um, you can set rules and times. So if you're, you want your students or your child off of the internet at nine o'clock, you can shut the internet off on their APS issue device at nine. You can have total control from your cell phone and you can also contact your principals for more information and they can get in contact with their schools, educational technology specialists. Securely is fantastic. It's a fantastic tool that you should definitely be using um, with, your, your, with your children. Is this my slide? I don't think so. Library of Media Services is a great, oh no, that is Ms. Saunders. I think that's me, Tommy. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jennifer Saunders. I'm the Director of Library Media Services. To help our students become successful learners, they need to be proficient readers. To become a proficient reader, our students must practice reading. To practice reading, our students should be able to visit and use the Library Media Center. In APS, every school has a certified school library media specialist in our library media center who helps our students learn about their personal reading habits and sets goals for their reading. So when we think about personalized learning from the library media center, we land in the space of student reflection and goal setting, which is one of the four components of personalized learning. Next slide, please. One thing our library media specialists are doing this year in alignment with personalized learning is to help each student recognize their reading identity. They help discover who students are as a reader. When students learn about their reading identity, it's more than what is your favorite book or who is your favorite author. It's really digging into personalized reading habits like where do you like to read? Do you have books at home? Is there a time of day in which you prefer to read? Do you read when you aren't assigned a reading task? 
Are you a part of any reading programs? Our library media specialists start with reading identity and we ensure that there is district-wide and school-wide programming to give our students the opportunity to grow healthy, independent, free choice reading habits. Next slide. Some of the programs we have include Race to Read, which is a district and citywide effort to build a city that reads. We have an annual Helen Ruffin Reading Bowl competition. We partner with the Georgia Tech women's basketball team with a program called Buzzer Readers to encourage our students to read independently and they keep a log of their reading habits. These are just a few of the programs that are available to our students to help them reflect on their reading habits set goals and become even more proficient readers. Now I'm going to toss it to my colleague, Cassandra Holmes. Good evening, parents. I am going to share with you a little information around Atlanta Virtual Academy and how we incorporate the four core values of our personalized learning. So when we begin to look at targeted instruction, when we look at um, uh, self self-paced, when we look at creativity, all of those pieces are embedded into the virtual program. Our students are able to choose the type of courses they want to take. Uh, some of them are accelerating in the middle and high school. Some of them are recovering credits to catch up so that they can graduate on time. Uh, and then of course, they have an opportunity to work when it is best suitable for them. So they have flexibility and ownership in their learning. If they are night owls and they want to do their work online at, at the evening time, they can certainly do that. And if they're traveling with their parents, if they are aspiring to be um, semi-pro athletes and they are away training, this is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for them to still stay abreast with their learning but have choice around when and how and what they want to learn. In addition to that, uh, a lot of the tools that Tommy Clay shared with you in terms of engagement and creativity and collaboration, we embed those uh, tools and experiences within our virtual platform so that students are engaged and they're able to collaborate with their peers, although they are virtual. So if this is something that sounds interesting, to you and your family, and it's a possible fit, I would encourage you to reach out to your homeschool counselor and they will be able to guide you uh, with how to get started with AVA. Our fall enrollment, our spring enrollment, my apologies, our spring enrollment uh, is through December 16th. It is now open. So again, if you are interested in your sixth through 12th grader taking a online course uh, in an asynchronous format, please reach out to your home counselor so that we can get them registered and we will welcome to have them in the spring. I believe that concludes this segment of the presentation and we're open for questions. Okay, I don't think we have questions. Thank you. You're muted, Ms. Weems. Good evening, everyone. I am back to discuss our APS vision for math, teaching, and learning. During the spring of 2022, our district implemented a math audit to determine the effectiveness of our math instruction across the district. One of the recommendations from the audit was to establish a district-wide vision for mathematics teaching and learning. The purpose of this math vision is to establish a clear pre-K through 12th grade vision for excellent mathematics instructions across Atlanta Public School. Also to train all mathematics educators on the pre-K through 12th grade vision for excellent mathematics instruction so that they can use this vision as the foundation for effectively teaching mathematics. Our goals are as follows, to ensure that all students are engaged in grade appropriate assignments, 
to ensure that all teachers are providing strong instruction, to ensure that all students are deeply engaged in the content of the lesson, and to ensure that all teachers have high expectations for their students. Next slide, please. At the top of the page in the orange box, you will see the APS vision for math teaching and learning. And it states that all APS students, regardless of race, socioeconomic status, or learning differences will consistently experience high quality mathematics instruction that positions them to graduate prepared for college, career, and life. On the bottom of this page, one second, please. There's a little more that I wanna share. So on the bottom of this page, you will see the APS vision for math teaching and learning. And it states, and I really wanna read this because this is something I wanna really hone in on. See mathematics, all Atlanta public school students will. See mathematics as a connected discipline that helps them understand the world and critique new ideas, demonstrate that they are flexible and resourceful problem solvers by making meaning of the mathematics. It also will challenge each other's thinkings through reasoning and evidence-based critique, engage in productive struggle with grade level aligned tasks that invite them to use their prior knowledge to build new understanding as well as demonstrate their mathematical understanding with peers and teachers, both orally and in writing through grade appropriate mathematic representations. Exhibit a growth mindset by taking risks, seeking feedback from teachers and peers and reflecting on both their successes and mistakes. And last but not least, all of our students will be able to collaborate with peers and build relationships based on mutual respect and inclusion of each other's mathematical ideas. Next slide, please. So on the left-hand side of this chart, you see the same seven skills from our math vision for teaching and learning. On the right side, we have provided a sentence to help you understand exactly what it means. So each sentence on the left coincides with the sentence on the right. For example, all Atlanta public school students will see mathematics as a connected discipline that helps them understand the world and critique new ideas. What does that mean? That means that they will understand how math can be used in other subject areas and in the real world. Next slide. So how parents can help with math at home. We wanted to give you some strategies so that you too can be an active part and an active participant of your students learning. So first of all, just point out math in everyday life. For example, when you're cooking, they can help you cook by measuring the items and their ingredients in your recipe. They also can help you count how many, even for our younger learners, and encourage your child to figure out answers to real life situations. When your child is working on math homework, ask him or her to explain how he or she got the answer. And any of you, I have a, a senior, even doing that with him, I can't always understand some of the things that he's doing, but it helps for him to be able to explain it to me. Have your child teach you math. We all learn better by doing and explaining. So that is one that really will take them a long way. And provide your child with verbal math problems. You can do it on the ride home. You can do it anytime you're traveling with them or just alone at dinner. Embrace the struggle. Allow them time to think. Struggling builds character. So allow your child to work through the problem so that when they run into problems, they know how to work through it. They know how to think about it and it does not frustrate them. And last but not least, avoid negative math attitude. Anytime that you say math wasn't my favorite subject or I didn't like math in school, that then helps and then contributes to your students' negative math attitude. What's next for math instruction? 
we will continue to build teacher knowledge about the math vision for teaching and learning. We will implement new math standards during the 2023-2024 school year. And we will adopt new math textbooks in our elementary and high schools in the spring. Next slide. Our math textbook adoption information is as follows. A committee of various stakeholders has been selected to serve on the new MAP textbooks. It will consist of teachers, administrators, instructional coaches, as well as specialists and parents as well. Once the committee narrows down the choices, the textbooks will be available for parents to, to preview and provide feedback. The MAP textbook adoption committee will begin meeting this month and the final textbook selection will be made by March 31st. Next slide. Are there any questions about MAP, I mean the MAP textbook adoption and or our MAP vision? Thank you. Our, our, our next MAP testing window will begin, and as a matter of fact, it has already began. We are currently testing um, our students in MAP and it began on uh, with the MAP growth assessment. It began on November 4th and it will end on November 18th. And it's for all students, kindergarten through 12th grade. Remember that the MAP growth assessment is given to all of our students. So please make sure that your students are present each day at school. The MAP fluency test window is scheduled for December 5th or 9th. This MAP fluency assessment is given to all students in grades pre-K through second grade only. As soon as we finish the next MAP assessment, you'll receive a family report for each of your children to let you know how they performed on the winter assessment and how their performance compared to how they performed in the fall. Are there any questions? And I know that there are questions in the chat. My colleague is answering the questions. It's, let's see. Let me read about so the questions. So. Miss Williams, I answered the question in the Zoom and the YouTube chat, so I think we're good. Okay, thank you, Tom. I appreciate your help. Well, thank you, Miss Williams, and this you concludes our parent um, training for this evening. Thank you so much for your participation. On behalf of our Chief Academic Officer, Yolanda Brown, and the whole Division of Academics, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you soon.